aspect in our data vision at IBM. Uh, so very pleased to be here with all of you today. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us and with the experts at The Economist about the power of data and what data can do for businesses. This is an area where IBM spends a lot of time and investment. Um, it powers our own innovation in AI and all that we do in our AI for business collaborations with clients globally. Uh, but we have a saying at IBM, there's no AI without IA, and IA is information architecture. Um, so today we have a great lineup of different experts and speakers um, all talking about best practices and how to get the most power out of data and looking forward to these discussions with all of you. Thank you. All right, is this working? working? Perfect. Well, buongiorno, good afternoon, everyone. So excited to be here with you today in this really exceptional location in which we're finding ourselves today. My name is Walter Pasquarelli. I'm a contributor at Economist Impact, specializing in data and artificial intelligence. And I would like to really express a very warm welcome to everyone here at today's forum called The Data Dividends, Harnessing the Power of People, Processes, and Technology to unlock value from data. Now, the data dividend is part of a series IBM that is part of a series of events, apologies, that is sponsored by IBM that we are hosting around the world, in which we are really discussing how organizations can put some of their information architecture and some of their data to work. And in fact, this is not the first time that we are in Milan. We were here already last year. And I remember very well that at that point, the kind of questions that executives were asking themselves. Coming out from a world that was in a pandemic, we found ourselves with so much treasure troves of data. And so the questions were really about, what do we do with this data? How can we put it in action? How can we design a self-service that allows our people to get this data and put it into action to generate some value? And now, one year on, a lot of things have happened. Generative AI chatbots have proliferated, proliferated the markets. Foundation models are now becoming sort of something that uh, companies are looking at in order to get value for themselves. And according to some of the studies that we see out there, we see that AI has now become the top one priority for businesses focusing on its adoption. Um, between Q4 and Q1 of 2023, we see that there has been an increase of 2,040% of investment reports on AI technologies. But just as Heather just said earlier, if we want to build AI, and if we want to focus on emerging technologies, there is one thing that we need to establish, and that's a data foundation. A data foundation to have readily available insights about customers, a data foundation that allows us to scale models, trial pilots, build momentum, and scale them across a whole organization, and so the question that naturally arises is how can we build it? And this is the question that we will seek to answer today together. Now for this we have put together a number of panels that I'm really excited to hearing the opinions of everyone who is joining here today. The first panel we will be asking the question, what's stopping enterprises from being data driven? We then have a second panel in which we look at the data literacy and talent component, how to build a growth mindset and culture, and a third panel where we look at the topic of data driven futures and harnessing ethical and responsible AI. We also have a new element, which is a debate, in which you, the members of the audience, will be able to participate directly in the discussions, share your opinions, and together sort of filter out some of the opinions that people here are having together in this room. I would like to thank IBM again for making this discussion possible in the first place. I will now hand over the stage to Agnese Ortolani, who is a principal economist focusing on European markets at the Economist Intelligence Unit, who will be co-moderating today's session together with me. So I wish you all a great time, full of interesting, insightful, perhaps provocative discussions at times. So thank you very much, and Agnese, over to you. Thanks everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today. And so for the first session, we are looking into what's stopping enterprises from being data-driven. 
And as you know, businesses face new challenges as they enter an era of economic and geopolitical volatility, and many firms must navigate fragile supply chains, a distributed workforce, and changing customer expectations. And data and analytics leader can unlock valuable insight to respond to the new business needs. And although data is an investment priority for many firms, few organizations can say that they are truly data-driven. So why is that? So we are going to explore this subject with the three panelists. And I'm glad to introduce again to you Heather Gentile, the Director of Product at IBM Data and AI. Hi, Heather. Nice to be here. And then we have Andrea De Mauro, data leader and book author at Data Analytics Made Easy. Hi, Andrea. And we also have with us Gabriela Vacca, Chief Technology Officer, Group Director of Enterprise Technology at Sky Italia, Sky Europe. Hi, Gabriela. So I think I will just start with, with the first question, which is also the title of the panel. So what, what do you think is stopping business for being fully data-driven today? And feel free to give your thoughts, and then we will we'll try to keep this as much interactive as possible. Heather, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think one of the challenges that we often see is data governance as a strategy often came together over a series of time. And so everyone's starting in a different place in terms of where the data resides. With global businesses, there could be different geographic implications around regulatory requirements and where the data needs to be stored versus who needs to access the data. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges is how do you um, provide secure access to that data in ways that is compliant with the geographies that the business operates. Um, it's also a challenge stringing together different data storages. You know, ideally, businesses can leverage a complete data lake house, but it's quite a process to evolve the storage of current data to get to that place. Um, the good news from IBM's perspective is that there's technology that can help with all of this. Um, prior to focusing on AI the past five years or so, uh, I also worked within our data fabric business unit. Um, and with data fabric, we are able to leverage you know, different data masking capabilities, um, security focused technologies that allow secure access to the data wherever it resides over hybrid cloud. But again, this, this requires a continuously evolving data strategy that has the support of the organization of an investment area. Um, data just can't be about storage, because if it ends there, you don't have that information architecture that can then build the innovation for your company. And Andrea, what, what do you think is stopping businesses from being fully digital? Yeah, where to start, right? There's yeah. many uh, complexity, otherwise, uh, uh, it would be certainly commoditized uh, as, a, as a topic, and uh, certainly less interesting to uh, to talk uh, to talk about. No, I would, I would add to what um, Heather said, which I uh, totally see and agree with, right, the importance of an integrated uh, information architecture and uh, the right data governance, which everyone is struggling with. I would add the human elements, people-related uh, elements. And um, uh, we ran a survey with uh, some uh, um, universities. Uh, we asked 250 people. They were actually uh, it Italian uh, uh, managers uh, and uh, practitioners. We asked them, what's the single thing you struggle with the most? And actually, uh, the top three items were all related to people. The first one was data culture, having the right culture, which means also being open to be ready to change the rules of the game, the way the business is run completely and comprehensively uh, with data, which is easy to say, everyone says uh, so, but then uh, nobody's actually uh, doing it. And the second aspect is the, is the organization, is the, uh, uh, getting the right people in the right uh, uh, places of the organizational structure and the business functions. Uh, often we are data scientists who live in the uh, ivory tower of 
um, well, the data science floor, which sometimes is my, my stool in the building. And uh, <laughs> no, but not necessarily, but. And um, I think finding the right balance of getting uh, data professionals in, embedded in the business, but at the same time able to actually be focused on the uh, longer term investments, right? Otherwise, they, they end up doing dashboards. I think that's the other thing that struggle. And the third um, element is the skills overall, uh, acquiring the right talent, which there is always shortage. Off, and I'm sure you know, many people in the organization, in the, in the room, will, uh, I think, um, will think alike. And, uh, and retaining them as well. Not easy, because now the like, data science gets excited about, uh, with, a, with, a, with a promise of you know, being able to experiment, and, and then they end up doing uh, something that is, must be done, that is different from what they had in mind. So also you know, having the right career path, I think, that's, That's the, the other element. human element uh, we have been striking with the most. And Gabriella, do you think we have missed anything here? Or what, what, what do you want to add? So I, I want to add uh, the, to what you know, has been said, but and, and also bring the, the, perhaps a use case in terms of uh, Sky Italia. So we sample a few, a few times on uh, we, we said that we wanted to be data-driven, we thought we were data-driven because we had a few reports that, that provided insights, right? But the reality is that we did not have a framework, a truly strategic framework that had a plan from a technology perspective, a plan for data, which type of data? I mean, data is such a generic term, if you think about it, right? You gotta understand the data for what, what is your really, really your priorities. So we had to uh, hire a chief data officer, uh, focus on bridging technology and, uh, and uh, what we call the value driven. We had to change the culture of the organization um, and explain that the leaders had to constantly change, okay, which data do you have to sustain that specific hypothesis? So it was, it was a, the, the, the question about data became so, is becoming, I should say, so entrenched in the culture of the organization, the new CEO, you know, made the data, data being a data-driven company as a first priority. But the bottom line is that we needed to move from a dream to a plan. And the plan required funding, focus, and a strategic framework we didn't have before. So now we can say that we are certainly on that path, but the path is real. And uh, month by month, we see new, you know, new intelligence, new capabilities, uh, and, uh, and uh, so a basically value for the business. That, that brings me really to the next question, which is so how business do you build a, a solid, robust, and trust data foundation, especially when it comes to um, tackling issues like data complexity, and especially in, in an environment where businesses are spread like around the world, really. So, Heather, maybe you have some insights as well from your experience at IBM. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think, you know, as businesses are investing in data, quality is a top area of focus, um, and having the right strategy to ensure that quality. Um, as I mentioned before, whether it's leveraging a comprehensive data lake or being able to um, you know, secure data with a hybrid stra cloud strategy so that it is housed according to regulatory requirements in different geographic areas. Um, the importance of having a strategy around how the data is put together is something as a best practice that should continuously evolve. Um, so it's not one investment and you're done, there's new technology being introduced all the time that may solve for challenges and gaps in the current processes and make that data not only more accessible, but more secure um, as there's you know, new challenges and threats um, coming into the data from a cybersecurity perspective as well. Yeah, I would, I would um, add uh, an element of the foundation, the data foundation is the um, uh, as I mentioned, the data governance, so governing the right uh, data assets in the right, uh, in the right way. 
I think that's uh, yeah, that's another pain point, especially for data in the data rich industries, which uh, I was uh, involved in the last ten years, which is telecommunications. And data, a first party data rich company, so uh, hard, right, to get the right data governance. And I think they, from my experience, what uh, makes the trick uh, there was to find a way to show with an equation or with illustrations to show the value of having the right data governance. This is not uh, something we can assume everyone would, in, especially in the, lab, in the board, at uh, the executive level, will uh, understand. Uh, data governance looks like uh, the boring uh, compliance uh, type of activity. Why me, right? So the first question. <laughs> when we approach data stewards or custodians, you know, why me? Um, but uh, finding stories, uh, telling stories of value creation that was enabled only and solely due to data assets, and for instance, uh, the richest uh, machine learning models have a feature set that is uh, well governed, easy to say within professions, but we have to explain it to executives and to uh, board members. But uh, once you have stories of this kind, and you can actually monetize have an estimate, possibly an ROI estimate of the investment in building the data foundation and uh, having the right discipline of data governance around. I think that that's, at least in my experience, made the trick. Yes, makes sense. And Gabriella, uh, since you mentioned the importance uh, of uh, data framework already, so maybe you can elaborate a bit more on the challenges that you face and solutions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, and for us, the strategy is really required to look at, to look backwards and understand uh, why are we missing such an important element in our strategy. Part of the reason was that you know, Sky Italia was a, a, a broadcast type of business through satellite, right? And when you have that type of architecture, let's call it, and, and, and distribution, you really don't know your customers, right? Because you, you broadcast. And so uh, through the trust, but as we are becoming more and more, you know, streaming and, uh, and uh, you know, all the obviously how the industry is changing with OTT and so on, the concept of understanding who your customer are becomes critical. So that was one element. The second element that for us was a big barrier was the fact that we had technologies that were literally monolithic. And to talk about the architecture, the information architecture. So we had to accept that we needed to do some major investment to become digital, which is uh, obviously what we're doing. Um, the, the cultural element obviously was important. I mentioned it. I mentioned it before. And also, we had to realize that our um, lighthouse was anything that was surrounding the customer experience. Of course, adding the complexity of cyber privacy and uh, and, uh, and and so on. So so. Those, uh, those foundational elements became critical for us uh, to basically help us go through our journey. And uh, um, uh, how do you think you, uh, as uh, data leaders, uh, what can you do to ensure the buy-in from the board of the organizations uh, in terms of having the business strategies that align and are conscious of the importance uh, of, uh, of uh, having a good data strategy, really? Um, so I think, um, you know, going back to Andrea's point, the ability to articulate <coughs> ROI and return on investment in the value that the data can provide the organization is a very compelling way to get that continued investment that's needed in the inform information architecture to carry the strategy forward. Um, and this certainly is easier to do now with the focus on generative AI and AI in support of business innovation, none of that can succeed without data governance. Um, because without strong data governance and the ability to show data lineage and explainability in those AI models, a business won't achieve the innovation. So I do think that adding that ROI focus to investments happening in data governance and you know, the outcomes of those investments 
and how their prop their, their propelling innovation within the organization is going to get the attention you know the C-suite um, of finance in order to procure those investments. And Andrea, do, do you agree with that? Or? I, I would just add uh, two things. First is um, the, uh, the importance of engaging first-person board members directly, making it engaging for them. And an easy way could be to run uh, workshops, uh, ideation works like these days, you know, like uh, design thinking ideation workshops, to talk about the themes of the day, right? Like generative AI together with the board, <coughs> making them first person experience what it feels and ideating uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, value proposition. And when it starts from the board, um, they will feel more engaged. And uh, once uh, I was in one of the previous uh, companies I worked with, um, we organized a um, one day training session on AI and uh, data for the board. And it looks, looks like, like sci-fi, sci but it's, it's reality, reality, trust me. So we got them for six uh, hours to learn the basics of uh, machine learning. We got them to understand how a decision tree model is built. And actually, with a simple low-code uh, tool, we get, we get them to actually experience what it feels. And actually, it was amazing. Like, from the day after, they started to ask the right questions. It wasn't easier for the data scientists. They started to ask questions about like accuracy and uh, overfitting. And so it became more difficult to manage their uh, uh, expectations. But it was super engaging and it worked very well. The last bit uh, with that is about sponsorship. And uh, whenever uh, a sponsor of a data project is someone that has got the word data or information in the title, that's, that's not going to work. So. Many of you in this room have got either the word data or information in the title. And for those of you, you know, uh, you should um, change ownership and sponsorship if by any chance you are the sponsor, because that's a recipe to failure. Uh, we've seen it uh, so many times. Business should really, really own data projects from, from you know, end to end, possibly. Can we use that trick? <laughs> Um, for us was uh, the, first of all, we had to remove some friction between uh, the business and technology, right? Because unfortunately, the da data was uh, the, always the, you know, the last step in the development process. And, uh, and, and that was simply not working and it was creating friction. So we started to, uh, celebrate success. In some cases, it was the return on investment. In some other cases, were small successes to bring the team together. In the meantime, of course, we had a strategic framework that was taking shape. And, uh, um, and then we also used, uh, uh, we started to pay more attention to how we shared information with infographics. Because the business was used to look at reports, right? Like spreadsheets, and I mean, my goodness, are they boring or not? So put something that is a little bit more visually appealing in front of executive that typically look are uh, used to a level of, uh, um, you know, the, the graphic that is engaging and is meaningful. So we started to take a little more, pay a little more attention to that. Um, so, so, so these, uh, these elements, uh, again, help us through the journey and, uh, and uh, they also help us with uh, uh, getting specific investment. And uh, we, we picked some investment that where it was perhaps easier to see the return on investment. Like for example, sales was a big uh, priority for us in terms of understanding the customer through the sales channel. And then the second was the voice of the customer in terms of after the activation, what happened, right? What is the quality of your service? So when you, when you watch TV, digital, and, uh, and, and so forth. So operational and sales so were probably the first two in the, in the strategic framework, the first two priorities in the strategic framework that we put in place. And maybe a final question from me, and then we will open up to the audience in case you have any questions for our speakers. 
Um, how do you keep up uh, with the technological changes? How do you keep your strategy always uh, on top of what's going on in terms of technological advances? There's so much out there happening in Russia, as I mentioned. So getting out of the office, getting the front of the culture, um, and broadening your perspective and understanding the things that are going on, but all of that data strategy and communication is the important stuff. Um, I think understanding um, the needs of the business and the link to supporting innovation um, in support of revenue growth is another area where we're seeing a lot more alignment among the different stakeholders in the organization. So the CDO isn't solely working with the chief technology officer um, to put together the strategy around data. A lot of this is being driven by the business and even um, now with risk and compliance is a budgeted proponent of the strategy. Um, when we look at the legislation happening across the EU now with the EU AI Act, organizations need to be ready from a number of perspectives. Um, and so, you know, with the right alignment with stakeholders, you have a lot of C-level support across the organization to continue to make those investments to drive the data governance strategy forward. And it, it's, it's such a successful model um, to get that funding and investment. Yeah, um, it's hard to keep up with <laughs> everything that is happening. No, just a couple of uh, ads that uh, uh, then it's super important to have a um, solid uh, community of practice uh, framework in place for data professionals to be in, this, in the position of talking about advancement and having uh, outside uh, the outside in uh, with external uh, external guests and this could be also very engaging for uh, for them and and indeed this um, uh, relates to the second part which is having a um, portfolio of innovations uh, which include also the uh, uh, moonshot uh, 10x kind of um, innovation, very ambitious innovation ideas in the area of AI, AI. Uh, even if uh, it takes only maybe 10% of the time of people, um, that is an important lever for uh, retaining them, especially data scientists, I don't know your, your experience have been, but uh, retaining them is uh, hard and uh, having a portfolio of uh, deep uh, longer term uh, but more than longer term, but very ambitious innovation assigned to, to everyone um, has been um, helpful for uh, keeping retention at an acceptable uh, level. Well, we started to be more, I would say, intentional um, in our research for companies and technology solutions that, that basically will help us achieve the vision. So for us, the technology framework was important. We also started to reach out and really create a, a global strategy with, uh, you know, across the Sky Group with the UK and Germany, as well as with Comcast, who is the, the company that, that, that bought Sky four years ago. And, uh, and so we started to create uh, that peer-to-peer -peer network, at least to understand the, which type of opportunity in technologies and, and try not to deviate too much from uh, um, a group direction, let's say, which I think for us, uh, it was a value. Um, also, we stopped talking, you know, when, when we had a team that was not specialized, we had non-specialized people talking with everybody and coming up with ideas that were, of course, the most brilliant ideas of all, right? The reality is, uh, is that data has evolved in ways that require specific skills Data scientists are very different than, uh, than uh, you know, a platform, uh, platform operation, could be in the cloud or whatever it is. And, uh, and, and so that's uh, um, the framework I was talking before also applied to the skills for people to corral, to guide their, or their, their conversation with the broader group as well as with external partners. Thank you. And maybe now we can open up to the audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to take the opportunity of having our panelists here to throw the questions you want to them. Yes. Thank you. 
And maybe if you want to introduce yourself with your name and the company you work for. importance of culture um, to manage all these uh, changes. So uh, concretely, how mainly in large organization where it's difficult to, to catch all the people, how uh, to uh, cascade this culture, how to improve and empower people to manage all this data, all this information? Yeah, thanks. We are going to explore this topic in the next uh, session as well, but maybe you can bring your personal like, experience. Yeah, well. I'll just briefly respond that for us, that number one, we needed, to, we needed to remove friction. Okay, that's because when people are angry to each other, not much work gets done. And, uh, and so that's one. Then second, uh, we, um, we stumbled two or three times. Many is these poor data scientists where shift from the business and then they move to technology and then they back to the business. So that was a stumble number one. Stumble number two was that uh, um, technology, uh, so we actually took data from technology and I sup completely supported that decision and moved it to an, um, another organization that was completely dedicated to data and did not have the ambition to help me design how I do the information architecture to support the, the proper data. Same with the business. The business gave people to this uh, chief uh, data officer so that at least uh, there was a, a good, um, you know, a, a good view into not only the foundation for data but also the value. And then we started with uh, constant uh, celebration, constant uh, showing to the actual team that we were still working together, you know, all the leaders of the company with the uh, CDO and the CTO, which is me. So, so that is, has started to change the way we were working together, right? And then it's like uh, an, uh, an avalanche. When you start to get a few successes, then it builds. And, uh, um, and that's, really, that's really cool. If, and yeah. If I may, I just want to cut a couple of, a couple of stories about this starting of the avalanche, no? because that's, yeah. that's the most <laughs> difficult bit. But um, first, I mean, uh, you need to work on broad fluency, broad education. People are afraid of what they don't know. That's as simple as that. And um, I've seen uh, brilliant examples of broad data and analytics fluency programs, both uh, PNG and Vodafone and uh, companies alike, um, which are open to everyone, not only with people with the word data in their title, everyone, market, <coughs> marketers, sales yeah. reps, uh, executives, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, when people get their hands dirty, maybe with a low code uh, tool so that they don't need to uh, code, uh, not everyone will uh, appreciate uh, uh, to be forced to learn how to code, uh, but th that has helped a lot. It has created also a common language to talk and to dream together about uh, what data can actually do in the everyday uh, work. And the other element is about uh, organizational uh, strategy, organizational design. If you have uh, uh, the data people embedded in the business teams, uh, I, you know, I always say, give the analyst a seat at the table. You know, ask yourself, do you have data professionals in the place where decisions are made, or they are just consulted or informed or send PDF files with a table without yeah. charts to those who make decisions? That's where the magic happens. When you have the, the data people embedded in the same room, sitting at the same table where decisions are made. It doesn't mean that you need to promote uh, the data mm -hmm. professionals to be able to, to be allowed. But they are a staff um, uh, yeah, role. Embedded. Yeah, embedded. We did exactly. the same when I said, you know, they're part of the chief data office, but the reality, they are fully embedded, but at least they work as a guild, let's say, as a, as a, as a broader team. So. And Heather, what about you? 
Yeah, I, th I agree with the points that were made earlier, you know, from a best practices standpoint, breaking down silos, you know, empowering people to understand the power in the data, um, understanding what's important to the business, the different perspectives of the stakeholders all help to establish culture throughout the organization. I mean, if you think back to when the GDPR requirements went into effect and how much training organizations had to do very quickly so that employees would understand you know, the ramifications if data privacy wasn't respected, um, that was a monumental effort back then. We're seeing similar types of efforts that will happen for organizations adopting AI. Um, but I think it is you know, empowerment of each individual employee um, that happens through training and education that goes a long way through establishing the culture. I think we have time for another question. Um, because we have four minutes. I think we had a hand here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Share the time. I'm uh, Alessandro Rano. I'm, I'm running as managing director of pharmacy chain. Uh, pharmacy chain means uh, working in uh, a very regulated uh, area. So more than people and culture, I'm worried about the, the legal frame. Uh, what is your perception? You, you think the legal frame in healthcare business is, uh, is clear, uh, it's safe, uh, everything is, uh, is okay, or, or we have to handle uh, unclear situation, maybe country per country, or Europe versus the US? Um, so there's, there's no shortage of proposed regulatory uh, legislation and guidance as well in the US. Um, if a regulator proposes guidance, it's, it's the same as if we have a law, right? Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges is, especially if you're operating globally, just keeping up with the sheer volume of how many different requirements the organization might be subject to. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the management of the controls that helps you to comply with the requirements, whether it's industry standards, regulatory, or even your own internal policies. Um, this is where I've done a number of innovation projects. Um, if you can get a complete control library um, regardless of what the compliance topic is, and then leverage existing controls to comply with a number of requirements. Um, it creates efficiencies within the organization that really does help give you the confidence that you'll be able to operate in compliance, especially with new emerging areas like requirements for adopting AI can be particularly restrictive in insurance, um, as well as pharmacy from what I've seen. Um, so I would look for, you know, opportunities to optimize um, because there'll, there'll be no shortage of challenges with all the regulatory focus in this area. I'd like to add one point, completely agree. Um, I think that the data, I'm not sure what is correct, custodianship, so basically how many data, how, how much level of propagation data has from a source system, that needs to be number one, in my opinion, for especially for companies that are highly regulated. Because the problem is that you extract data, data gets put in a different system, then it gets manipulated with something else, and then it goes to a level two, and then a level three, and you lose control of that chain. So uh, very important that you have exactly what Heather said, but also that you have process and technologies to protect the source of data and who is watching that data with full traceability. That's easy to say, it's very expensive to do. It's very expensive to do. We might have time for another question, if you have one. Yeah, thanks. director in uh, management uh, consulting with primary focus on business planning and strategy. I have a question on what are uh, the key KPIs, key performance indicators to measure the data dividend? And uh, is there any uh, clear example of um, how uh, this correlation uh, between data and company performance? 
we have a question on correlation. So the correlation between KPIs and business performance, is that what you're asking? I'm sorry, you know, you were, your voice was fading, so we sorry, couldn't hear um, very well. Sorry, uh, I'll first I want to know if, uh, what are the KPIs to measure data dividend? Uh, and second, if there are any example of how uh, uh, this uh, KPI uh, measurement is um, improving company performance. Mm. Okay, so um, first, many different type of KPIs, obviously, depending on, uh, on uh, business, could be sales, could be churn, could be revenue, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But the way we are correlating with uh, the business strategy and the projects is actually when, we, for example, when we design a new capability or we launch a new product. At that point, before the product is launched, you need to ask, according to you know, typical agile type of methodologies, uh, what are the key elements? What do you want to achieve? What is the wow that you want to have? Now, it seems a very basic question, but if you can translate that wow factor into two things, two or three maximum, that matter to the business, then you're gonna start uh, you know, injecting change and excitement into your, into your organization. Um, you want to try to then? summarize as much as possible? Yeah. yeah because it says yes. zero, zero, zero. Yes. Scary. <laughs> yeah, no, this was a very interesting uh, question. So there are a few studies out there. Maybe you can share uh, some pointers uh, separately um, that correlate uh, the maturity level of an organization when it comes to data analytics and financial uh, top and bottom line uh, impact. Uh, there are a few studies, a few consultancy firms that put that together, happy to share with you lately, but on the um, KPIs, uh, I think, um, yeah, of course, plenty of KPIs available out there, but I think it's, it's important to have a mix of uh, KPIs that monetize uh, in terms of top line and bottom line impact, the specific uh, data activations, uh, and that one is, uh, uh, of course, it depends on, uh, on the business case, but it could be sales incrementality or it could be um, uh, customer base retention uh, or churn. Um, but the other, the other elements are about uh, the, um, the, the way a company is actually able to make decisions. So time to decision, for instance, in some aspects, you know, I've seen that implemented is very, very helpful uh, whenever you have the opportunity to measure actually how long it takes to make a decision and what's the impact of in innovating and uh, enriching, data enriching the operating model around. Uh, and I would also mention it's helpful to have these maturity models in place so that you can always, on the longer run, mid and long range, uh, measure yourself. Uh, many of the transformations we need to do to be data-driven are multi-year expensive and long uh, investments, and it's very important to have from the beginning a uh, matrix uh, systems uh, available. Um, maturity models, so I will certainly look into that uh, to put in place. Heather, do you want to add anything else before we wrap up? I think it's well covered and I know we're out of time. Okay, fair, fair. Well, thank you very much to our speakers for the insights. It has been a very insightful session, so thank you. Um, And I think we can move on to our next session, and, uh, which is on data literacy and talent, building a growth mindset and culture. And I think I can welcome to the floor already uh, Stefano Zoni, Chief Data and Analytics Office at Creden Banca. Hi, Stefano. We also have Paolo Balboni with us today, Professor of Privacy, Cybersecurity and IT Contract Law at the European Center on Privacy and Cybersecurity at the Maastricht University. Hi, Paolo. And we have Antonio Bencini Farina, Head of Data Culture at Generali Italia. Ciao, Antonio. So in this panel, Sorry, I have problems with my mic. 
Um, we know that data and analytics have become cornerstones of digital business, and being data literate is vital for businesses to tap into the creative potential of their data assets. To this end, making data accessible to the workforce and empowering people to ask the right question is important to deliver better business outcomes. So today we are going to explore this uh, very crucial um, topic with our speakers. And uh, I would like to start our session by asking you uh, why um, is data literacy important to business? And how can data and analytics leader contribute to building a growth a mindset and culture within an organization? Okay, thank you. Um... Well, I, I guess that many topics uh, related to, to our speech were, were highlighted in a previous panel, I guess. There is a, a little bit of interest, I guess, on data culture. Um, okay, so to answer your question, uh, um, the, the most important thing uh, is quite a, a direct response to Andrea that I don't see here, but uh, some, is something that he, he, said, he said before, hi. Um, and I completely agree with you. Um, uh, just sketch, I, I try to sketch the context of General Italian in, for, for a few seconds. So um, I'm in General Italia since 2018, uh, and uh, at the very beginning uh, of the team, because the team uh, was called the Advanced Analytics Team in 2018, and uh, I was the 10th or 11th person in the, in the team. Uh, today we are 95. And uh, uh, at the very beginning, we are basically just 50-50 data scientists and data engineer. Uh, today, we, have, we are more and more, more diverse. We have DevOps, uh, uh, artificial intelligence experts. We, we work in agile like a very proper uh, software <laughs> developing company. Uh, but General Italia is a company with 150 years of history. So uh, when we started, we were like aliens in the, in the company, and I'm talking about a company which is based his business historically on data. Okay, so um, there was the need for new competencies and new technology. But we, from the very beginning, we were not uh, closed inside an ivory tower. We were open with everybody because, uh, um, just because we were the aliens, and we had, we must uh, speak with the whole business branches, because the, our perimeter is the whole General Italia country perimeter. So um, it's very important to share, okay? Uh, and to learn from people that were settling in General way before us, and to learn from business, and to um, help business to learn from us, because the sharing the culture means work together. Uh, in the previous panel, we, we, I've heard um, Gabriel, I guess, uh, talking about um, the concept of sharing uh, the common language. This is exactly my job. Uh, help the company building a common la language uh, between us, we are the technicians, not, not so technical, but technicians, let's say, and, and the business. So um, to share that, well, maybe I'll, I'll talk about that later, but it's very important to... Um, also um, build upskilling, reskilling courses, and uh, workshops, uh, and um, all together from, from, from at all levels, from, from top to, to down, okay? So this is a surmise of, of, of my, my, my idea to, to, to answer yeah. to your question. Thank you. And Paolo, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, uh, while um, uh, listening at uh, the previous panelists, uh, I started to think about uh, one, one word, which is uh, data science by design. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so of course inspired by you know, uh, data protection by design. I think um, um, what uh, uh, Andrea mentioned of the fact of having, having data scientists at the table to make decisions, it's uh, of course very important. But um, uh, what was uh, mentioned, I think, also by Gabriella and Ether is that the whole organization needs to be uh, literate about how to go uh, with the data. And I think uh, building data culture is uh, way more than uh, uh, sharing specific skills. 
on, on data, on data analytics, on data compliance, uh, on data security. But I think you really need to involve uh, your workforces at all level um, with, a, with a beautiful story around data. If you see, uh, you know, one of the topics that we were requested to address is the, you know, the great resignation. And I think uh, when, I, when I look at uh, organization that I uh, work with and collaborate or founded, you see that uh, especially new generations wants to be part of a virtuous story. Money is not enough, career is not enough, um, remote working is not enough. It's about uh, contributing to the greater good to our society. And I think uh, um, in that direction, I have also uh, developed uh, research at Maastricht University on data protection and cybersecurity as a corporate social responsibility. We have put together five principles, 25 rules, uh, many controls, uh, an auditable framework, but I'm not, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the fact that you can um, make data available to your organization the way you want. With the most powerful technology, you can train them. But if they do not belong to that story, if they don't feel involved and, and also aware that by doing what you are requesting them to do, they are going to contribute to a greater good, so to a sustainable growth and change in our society, I think you will fail. So, Data science by design, it comes down to me to uh, make sure that you can involve all workforces at all levels with uh, uh, an adventurous story uh, that will uh, show them and celebrate them when they actually do something good with the data, not just for the business, but for the whole society. And I think connecting dot in this direction uh, is the, the, the starting point of, uh, of a successful and effective story, and therefore also will provide the return on investment uh, for organizations. And what's your experience, Stefano, at Credem? Uh, the experience is, uh, first of all, you, you, you agree that you are in the digital world. In this digital world, the main important things uh, is the data. But it's not uh, the point that okay, permits us uh, to, uh, to develop this journey, to evolve uh, the culture in our company, evolve the value that can be generated from this data in, uh, in our company. Uh, you speak, uh, we have a lot of data. Uh, IDC in the, in the study that uh, have uh, every, every year uh, told us that in uh, 2025 we have 175 uh, um, zettabytes of data. Uh, if you remember a few, uh, few years ago, it's not this. Okay? The data is generated, is generated very, very quickly. Uh, the capacity of computational capacity is uh, very good, very fast. You can generate data in a few microseconds, generate information, then generate other information, then generate information that the people have to analyze. This, uh, this is difficult, difficult for uh, the big company that have the culture, have the mindset, and to change this mindset is not simple. Uh, my colleague, a older colleague that uh, speak uh, first uh, to me, uh, point uh, the, the, the address in the, the importance of the need, to develop what is the need, what is the important for develop a uh, solution for uh, the business. This is the big important point. And the need is not uh, the sea level that have only this need, is uh, the people in every part of my company, because the data is everywhere, is everywhere. It's for this, for example, in my experience, in Credem, you develop uh, two years ago uh, this uh, data community of uh, Data Hero that uh, is more now, now is uh, fix, uh, 600 uh, Data Hero in uh, the company that uh, you have 6,000 uh, uh, colleagues in, in group Credem. Uh, this um, colleague work without uh, the silos. Is uh, not work in the in the tower that uh, explained the colleague first, but uh, work everywhere in the retail, in the IT, in the risk management. Uh, that you default to the governance by default by design, <laughs> everyone, and um, and work everywhere. And every of these people have the the competence. 
Uh, another objective or of um, evaluation of proposal um, is developed in the three point. Um, valorize our data, valorize the resource the company take us, and valorize the talent of our colleague. When I spoke with the talent, well, uh, for us, um, explain the concept of uh, recognize this talent and uh, improve this talent. Because if the colleague have this talent, uh, have the passion. If they have the passion, he want to develop this and uh, develop energy for develop the solution can be the value for, uh, for our company. And going back to one of the points you raised and also to one of the questions we had from, from the audience before, um, from your experience, how do we ensure that the entire organization understands that uh, data literacy is also important to deliver good business outcomes? How to ensure that? Well, that, that, that's quite a complex question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, the most important thing is that showing results. Showing results and, mm, I mean, monetary results, too. Um, and, uh, um, in, in building trust. Um, this was exactly my experience, my experience at the beginning of, of this journey in general. For example, when I said before, I was, we were just 10, 12 people, and, but today we are 95 and, grow, and growing. So that means that um, results and uh, trust have been built in, that, uh, in the past seven, six, seven years. Um, doing that uh, is part of what I was, I, I was calling sharing before, because we were not just experimenting something in our ivory tower. We were um, uh, working very, very closely uh, with business. Uh, just to make an example, um, to be pragmatic, um, business usually comes to us with a problem and we build a solution based on data science and artificial intelligence together, um, and business drives. Um, that means that business sets the KPI for the specific projects. But we have to, again, build a common language in order to understand if we can do or not that particular outcome, and so, this was the basis, the first um, step of building cult culture. It comes naturally in a, in a, in a certain way. Um, when a project is finished, um, it's something that must be shared within the company, not just shares be, um, keep, kept between us who build the, pro the, the project and the solution and the specific line of business. This is something that can be a use case we can start building workshops on that. Uh, we have um, annually a couple of uh, events called um, something um, like a business translation that is um, a couple of hours together between us and the specific team that built a, a couple of, of selected projects and the business who received, but not just received, built the project and the solution within the technical team, um, streamed on the internet, open to the whole country, Italy, to show results. So that means, that means convince people that what we are doing is not just useful, but fundamental. Yeah, I, I would also say that, um, you know, the behavior of the sea level of the organization is fundamental. Uh, you can, uh, in my opinion, uh, organize uh, all uh, trainings and workshops uh, and, uh, you know, uh, awareness material uh, that you wish. But um, if the uh, top management uh, does not lead by example, it will be worth nothing. So you're just wasting money and actually it's counterproductive for the organization because uh, you will uh, announce distrust in the organization and the people will replicate a similar business. So the whole organization will potentially fail. Um, when, uh, when I say lead by example, uh, I think you need to think about the data in uh, three dimensions. Um, performance, of course, you need to do business. You need to generate revenues. Um, compliance. 
So you need to comply to the maximum extent possible to the legislation. And uh, the panelists before us already explained that there is uh, 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 an increase activity of the uh, European legislator regulating around uh, uh, data. So we're not talking about uh, uh, just uh, the GDPR uh, or the e-privacy directive and regulation in the future, but we're talking about uh, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, uh, the DSA, the DMA, but also uh, you know, the AI Act. But I think even before talking about the AI Act, we need to talk about uh, the data-related instruments like the Data Governance Act and uh, Data Act. So, I'm also a business lawyer, and our clients are typically multinationals, so therefore I said, try to reach the highest possible level of compliance. 100% will not be possible. If not, you're gonna be probably out of business. But at least you can compensate with the third dimension, which I think is about sustainability. So the fact that uh, the management, uh, the C-level, should, uh, uh, of course, lead the way for performance uh, to the maximum uh, possible level of compliance, but also showcasing that uh, the business that you want to do on data is not without uh, taking into consideration an ethical approach and sustainable approach uh, with respect uh, to the individuals and with respect to the planet. Therefore, I think it's also very important to um, identify the uh, data discussion in the domain of ESG, which is extremely uh, popular at the moment and extremely relevant to attract the fundings and to reassure shareholders uh, that your organization is going in the right direction. And actually, according to the research that we have developed at Maastricht University, you can make correlation between your privacy, cybersecurity, and data strategy in order to enhance your ESG score, which I think is very important because if you look at the rating agency and how they evaluate ESG score, uh, now, I don't think it's really based on very solid uh, ratios, to use a euphemism. So it's uh, very important, uh, I think, uh, that the leaders uh, also together in associations of business uh, will try to showcase that going about data in a way that is uh, responsible uh, in order to foster sustainable business uh, to the maximum level of compliance with the legislation will also contribute uh, to the ESG uh, score. Ah, Paolo, you remember me that there is a, a lot of acts arrive. Data Commerce Act, Data Act, I Act. And uh, in the concept of there is a lot of data, and a lot of capacity of computation is a perfect tempest <laughs> in this moment. Uh, for, uh, for the people that want to develop uh, a new uh, technology or new solution. Uh, but the important, uh, I think, is uh, to understand what is the value that could be uh, generated from this data or this solution. I love the question that uh, um, the, the person that uh, first uh, to uh, ask uh, this question about the KPI. Alors, in general, I think the KPI must be um, two big um, um, sector, the KPI that control or governance what I have to do, for example, the governance of data, the governance of algorithm, uh, what is the drift, uh, some solution, uh, what is the explainability of some solution, what is some, some uh, KPI that is important to understand uh, what is the quality of the solution that I've got. Other, other KPI is the KPI for what the value that could be generated from this uh, solution. In Credem, uh, in the last uh, year, you begin to um, uh, develop only the solution that generate the value for our company. And you um, as we, uh, develop uh, two papers with the university and with uh, some partner to um, calculate ex ante uh, what is the value of uh, this uh, solution. What is the value of, for example, activity or dimensional analysis of data quality? 
what is the value of, um, for example, of this uh, specific um, algorithm or art artificial intelligence. This um, uh, um, value that uh, could be generated by uh, this algorithm permit us uh, to speak with the business. Okay, you want to do this, uh, it needs this, this is the value. It's correct for you or not. And uh, this is important point because uh, the business have uh, the responsibility. The responsibility to, to ask uh, some things to return to the bank the, or the, my, uh, the company the value for, uh, for uh, the solution. This is point important because permit to uh, prioritize the solution, to decide what you want to need, and def define um, the, the strategy that permit us to uh, uh, calculate the value that could be generated for uh, our company. And uh, another important theme that I think uh, you mentioned already is uh, uh, the workforce. And uh, uh, what, what have been the challenges that you have seen in terms of your businesses in finding the right uh, um, people with the, the right uh, uh, skill sets as well, especially now that I think you mentioned the great resignation, but also the fact that there is quite a lot of labor, labor shortages in Europe as well. And so what, what do you think uh, um, are the, the solutions to that and what can be improved in terms of having a better prepared workforce for a more data-driven future? Well, I completely, I completely agree with you. In my experience, um, more on the beginning of that journey, now uh, data science and data engineering is a little bit common, for example, in university courses. Um, but yeah, it's still quite difficult to find um, truly prepared um, people. Um, also because um, it's not clear what data science and data engineering is. Um, it's an, an umbrella term. So uh, many people think that just because in the past 25 years we're building macros in Excel, they hire data scientists. That, that's not. Data science means building artificial intelligence solutions properly. Um, so uh, one solution is sponsor, sponsorship to universities, uh, building talent when they are growing, when they are studying. So uh, this is also, um, I guess, from my, my, my personal point of view, uh, an ethical act because um, it's a contribution to the culture, um, technical and not just technical, purely technical of, of country. Uh, so, uh, in fact, we have a lot of um, relationship with universities and so on, uh, and research, research centers. We sponsor <coughs> masters, and uh, also um, uh, one of the internal initiatives that uh, uh, is built by Data Culture, culture Team to um, upskill uh, people who are not data scientists but they are really, because they are from business, but they really work very, clo work very, very closely with, with, with us, with data scientists and engineers, is called Data Masters. It's uh, three months um, very hard working uh, program in collaboration with Univer Università Statale di Milano, um, where we give um, uh, the basis of data science, like Python languaging, um, SQL pro, uh, interrogation uh, and some things like that, but uh, and it is in collaboration with University uh, Università Statale di Milano and us. So we tackle the the business and the internal use case, uh, and the University of Milan tackle, tackles more, the more uh, technical side of the, that course. And um, also, um, we uh, think that is very important for, for our workforce, um, for uh, data scientists and engineer to explore, to uh, give them a space to do some kind of internal research. Uh, and this is also a, um, an answer that uh, touched the point of the great resignation, because data scientists, data engineer, AI experts, and so on, uh, we, everybody in that room knows that are very on demand. And uh, uh, so uh, it's not easy. There is a, a lot of turnover, so it's not easy to, 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 re to, to retain, to keep in, within the company. And they are very bright, uh, young uh, people. 
and so uh, giving, them, giving them space to uh, unleash their creativity because data science, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is, uh, is, is a very creative uh, discipline. Um, so all that things to the, together help creating also internal culture. Uh, so you see the three, the th the three edges <laughs> to, to work very, very, very close together. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and Pablo, yeah. maybe, do you want to add? Yeah, uh, very briefly, I think um, uh, there are at least three dimensions. One is uh, capacity building, uh, the other one is uh, um, collaboration uh, between the uh, workforces, uh, and um, uh, the, um, the last one is, uh, um, uh, you know, retention. Uh, I think uh, just a few words, uh, when, when we look at capacity building, private, public uh, uh, collaboration initiative between the university and the private sector, I think uh, they are very useful. Uh, at Maastricht University, we also have a specific advanced master on privacy, cybersecurity, and data management in order to try to contribute in this capacity building at uh, the international level. When we look at collaboration, I think it's, uh, it's very tricky because uh, you need to uh, make sure that an organization is uh, creating a common language uh, in order to share uh, information about the data in all different units and departments. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, people belonging to different units, departments, uh, teams, uh, they have um, their own specific language and it's difficult to find a way to effectively communicate. So uh, initiative in that respect to make the people effectively communicate uh, um, around data, I think is very, very important. Uh, with respect to retention, I mentioned before, uh, it's not just about the incentives, for their workforces, but it's also about to making them feel part of a, of, of a, of a greater project. And, uh, and especially um, a project that is gonna be developed uh, through the years uh, with a clear vision. And I think these are the three important dimensions to address. To the point that uh, explained at first, uh, um, uh, colleague is correct. Um, I, 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 um, I add uh, some things uh, that I think is important. First of all, uh, let's stop to sp speak about uh, the value of data. Begin to, uh, to um, understand that the value could be generated from the people that have uh, com competence to uh, generate uh, the value from this data. This is a point very important to, uh, to develop in, uh, in, um, in my company. In this case, uh, I explained first, uh, in our, data, comp uh, in our um, um, uh, data community, you, um, you search to understand what is the passion of the people and uh, understand what is the competence uh, could be uh, generated with, uh, with, with passion. This is a point important because uh, if you, uh, your uh, company recognizes uh, your passion or recognizes your uh, talent, uh, it's difficult to uh, resign after. This is, uh, I think, is the point to have the the retention of uh, the, the talent in our, uh, in our company. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes to take some questions from the audience. Anyone? We have two, I think. Yes. Hi. I'm uh, Fabio Narciso, uh, working in a, te a small telecommunication company like uh, data visualization expert. And my question is uh, uh, about uh, the perfect mix um, of younger experience data scientists than 20 years ago data scientists are not exist. So um, what kind of knowledge these younger people share with um, expert people, experienced people uh, like us, <laughs> 20 years of experience, and vice versa. Who wants to take this one? Well, very briefly, um, the mindset, the way to tackle problems. This is exactly what I try to build when I build courses, and this is exactly my daily job. I'm not interested in, in uh, sharing just technicalities, I'm interested to share a mindset. We see that problem from a different perspective. It's not better, worse, it's just different, and we have to uh, 
This is the basic of sharing a common language. So we learn from you, you learn from us. That's it. I think uh, maybe also try to think about reversing the paradigm. Usually in companies, the most experienced people are teaching to the youngest one. And I think uh, there is nothing worse than imposing these two generations to be in the same room and tell them how they need to communicate. It's not, it's not gonna work. Probably shifting the paradigm and giving uh, uh, a little bit of uh, stage and room for the uh, youngsters to uh, bring a presentation to not just the oldest one, but to the whole organization, I think that would be extremely powerful. And they always have better idea than, uh, you know, uh, usually the sea level, because they are young, they are strong, they are full of energy, and they dare. So um, I would uh, suggest that. Older and younger have the, 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 the talent in general and the experience to share. The objective is the point of, uh, is the needs or the solution that you have to develop. If uh, everyone uh, takes on the table our uh, <coughs> competence uh, could be generate value and can speak together with the same, uh, same word. The importance is, uh, one of the uh, point of uh, view is important is the data visualization because uh, the communication is one uh, important for, uh, for um, uh, permit uh, the people that don't know the technicality to speak the same, uh, same, uh, same, uh, same language. Maybe we can take a final question. So a hand there. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Raffaele Palombi from IBM. I would like to touch uh, an aspect uh, that is uh, cultural and uh, I can also say organizational to understand how you cope with that in your organizations. Uh, what's your propensity uh, to piloting, to run pilots in uh, your organizations? And uh, uh, what is also uh, the level of, of acceptance of a, a possible failure of uh, a pilot projects? Very high, because we work on an agile environment, so it's our daily bread. For me, the same. We work in an agile is uh, important in this, uh, this job. Well, I think also in the, in the educational environment, uh, speaking uh, as uh, academic of uh, the European Center on Privacy and Cybersecurity, there is quite a lot of uh, appetite to uh, uh, explore, for sure. Good. I think we are at the end of the session, so I would like to thank you, our speakers, for the thank insights. You. Thank you very much. And I will leave the floor to my colleague, Walter Pasquarelli, which will continue the session with an interactive one so that you can all interact. Perfect. Okay, microphone is on. Right, so now we're going to go into the debate element of our forum. And this is actually one of my favorite elements of our conversation because it allows everyone to be active. Um, a couple of house rules, and to, just to explain the rules. We're going to have basically a statement, a statement that is a little bit provocative, not controversial, but a statement with an edge. We're going to vote and understand who is in favor of the statement, who is against it. And then we'll have some roaming microphones going around, which will allow you to share your opinions on that. Now, the goal of the session is not to win the debate. <laughs> The goal of the session is to share some insights, okay? So let, let's keep calm. <laughs> but I would like to just share now the first statement, which is just over here, and it fits quite nicely with the, with the panel discussion that we just had a minute ago. So the first motion is, this house believes data culture is more important than talent. Okay, I'll read it out one more time. It's a little bit small. This house believes that data culture is more important than talent. Okay, culture, more important than talent. Who agrees with this statement? Please raise your hand. One, two, three. Let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, 14 people. Who disagrees with the statement? Please raise your hand. <laughs> you caught me. Okay, who's neutral? <laughs> One, two. All right. So 
So it's about 50-50 with some people who are sort of outliers and think it's neutral. Um, I would like to hear, first of all, uh, some opinions of people who actually think that talent beats culture. Who would like to go first? Please raise your hand. That is fine, too. Yes. A microphone is uh, just arriving. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself with your name and... And uh, I think that uh, uh, I'm neutral because it depends a lot of the on, on the context. In, the, in some context, uh, talent is uh, more important than culture. But generally, data culture may be more per pervasive. So it depends. It's very difficult to decide. When you have very critical problems, talent can be a differentiator. When you are standard approaches to data science, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, data culture is important to get success. So that's the reason why I'm undecided. Uh, interesting. So basically, talent is fast. Data culture will get you far, so to speak. If I, maybe, I'm not sure if it's a fair summary, but more or less. <laughs> OK, who would like to go next? Uh, yes, uh, the lady in the back, and then you, sir. Yeah. Francesca Maria Montemagno, Smartiva, founder and CEO. I think that uh, we, we need to understand what we intend and what we mean uh, when we speak about talent. Because if we speak about innative uh, abilities and skills, then perhaps uh, uh, when we speak uh, about data culture, we are speaking about change. So we need people open to change, uh, ready to embrace a new mindset. For this reason, I support culture instead of talent. Of course, it is important. It's the basis yeah. of a, an organization. We need talent, but it's not only what we need. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes, you, you sir. Thank you. Uh, I will be quick. Um, well, as head of data culture in General Italia, I support talent because without talent, we can't build culture. So. Talent is the basis. Um, we can pretend to build culture without talents, but we fail. So uh, talent first, uh, because talent is the basis of everything. Well, say that, give me a definition of talent, talent and give me a definition of data culture, and then we can, we can discuss more. But roughly, roughly sketching my, 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 my I thought this is my, my position. Fair enough, yeah. That's, that's actually a very good point. I mean, when we're talking about talent, we mean basically very skilled people. Whereas if you talk about data culture, and I'm sure someone will disagree with that, but data culture is basically the entirety of the organization and the, and the culture, if we look at it from that lens. Um, someone else, yeah, I saw the gentleman just over there had, had some, some thoughts on that. I believe uh, here it says um, both are important. Uh, culture and uh, talent, but the uh, question is, which one is more important? So if uh, we agree that both are important and one of them is more important, I would vote for culture, because the uh, culture uh, would eat talent strategy for breakfast. <laughs> so uh, it is like, imagine that you have a nice car, uh, but you, uh, without wheels. So culture is the wheel that will move the car. So that's it from me. Interesting. So who agrees that culture eats talent for, for breakfast? Okay. Okay. Yes. Great. What, do you want to say, share your opinion? As well? We just have a microphone coming for you. I think, so changing the sentence in, uh, in this context, it means that the culture is eating talents. Maybe it's for this reason, the reason that uh, the retention of talent of data science uh, is uh, so difficult for the companies uh, because you know they don't belong they don't belong to that culture they belong to another culture <coughs> especially because they belong to the millennium generation generation Z that are they, they have a, a a different mindset considering the old style Interesting. Yes, you, sir. Uh, microphone for, for Paolo. I thought you were lawyers. 
instead of uh, you know uh, being in the business of data because you said it depends and uh, you said uh, give me a definition of that this is typical lawyer <laughs> uh, okay okay but uh, no jokes apart I think uh, what we what we look is a uh, uh, talent based culture and I, I just uh, um, echo what you mentioned before during the panel uh, that you know uh, you have um, a lot of uh, people working in, a, in an organization and you need to discover their own talent and, and, and probably try to extract value from their talent and leverage them in order to build a culture of an organization valorizing the people and not valorizing an idea. I think uh, this is uh, probably something that can combine the two uh, concepts. Uh, yes, just over there. Thank you. Uh, Nede Ivanova, uh, CIO Group Risk Management of Unicredit. So uh, I have to say that normally for me the talent comes first, but in this case uh, I have to say that talent per se cannot make it, uh, they cannot make the difference because uh, data scientists and people who work with data are quite, uh, um, let's say they like the change and if they are not inside the right context, if there's not the right culture, then they would leave. They, they maybe do just one single case and they leave the company. So the data culture comes first for me, and this would put the basis in order to create a sense of belonging and mm. then to generate the talent and to develop it also internally. Thank you very much. So I, I think one of the things that I keep hearing is that data culture is an organizational's, or an organization's ability to create change. Do people agree with this? And, and yes, you, sir, and then I'll, I would like to, to follow up with that. Yeah, my name is Marco Vernocchi, I'm the UI Global Chief Data Officer. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, culture, both are important, as everybody I think agrees, but culture is important uh, because we're not talking about talent, we're talking about talents, right? <laughs> and that is a team sport, you need a, a collection of, and a, and a variety of different talents and skills, and uh, you may have specialty, but if you don't bring them together in an end-to-end -end logic, they remain standalone. So the, the question is not talent, but talents. Very interesting. Right. Someone else. I would like to hear from someone who feels strongly that talent supersedes data culture. You have the gentleman in the back. Okay, I'm Sean Carmody. I'm the Operational Excellence Manager for Eurofins Biopharmaceutical Testing. Um, I've been in the food industry and also pharmaceutical testing industry. And in my experience, data and poor data has actually damaged the culture and you need the talent to be able to now drive the culture back into businesses. Historically, data, which people didn't understand, has now <coughs> damaged them where they don't trust the current data, and we've got to drive, as the talented people, that culture within the business. Someone who disagrees, or agrees. Someone who wants to raise another point, otherwise I have a follow-up question on that. Yeah, you, sir. Federico Crecchi, uh, Head of Data Science at Promete, yeah. Um, I believe that it's, it's a matter of uh, the time scale. If uh, the point is uh, being able to quickly reach a result, but not really caring about the long term, then for sure talent is, is where to go. But uh, as was mentioned before, the terms of uh, keeping retention high and having a long-standing uh, impact on, on change, I strongly agree on the definition of data culture is uh, the ability to drive change in a company. If you don't manage to have the talent kind of uh, blending in within the company, or in other way, having the company understand how to, uh, let's say, uh, use data and transform, it, it will not be, it will be like Cristiano Ronaldo at Juventus, if uh, there are any football <laughs> fans here. It's, uh, Good it's comparison. not a long-lasting change. It's, uh, you need uh, yeah. the whole team to, to go in that direction, in my, in my opinion. I think there's actually a, a wonderful comparison, so. <laughs> yes, someone else. So do we accept that data culture is an organization's ability to change? Is there someone who has any thoughts on that? Uh, 
Yes, I see you nodding. Okay. So who else, because I saw a few more, I think it was about 14 people of the, of the ones, yes, yes, you sir. Uh, just the microphone's coming. I don't think that culture means a change, right? You don't think that culture means some, no, okay. the, the, the association is you may have cultures that drive change, but many cultures are resistance, resistant to change. So culture or data culture doesn't mean change. It may enable the context uh, to drive change, but it doesn't mean change. Many cultures are exactly the opposite. So the culture in itself doesn't associate with change without intention. Yes, Emanuela. I think that talking about, hi, I'm Emanuela Girardi and I'm the founder, not, okay, the founder of OpenAI and the president of ADRA today. And I think that talking about data culture is not enough because today we should talk probably about innovation culture because talking about, we will talk about in the next panel, but data, I mean, it's almost all that we should talk now about AI culture and tomorrow probably about the innovation culture. But talents, <laughs> you need them. So at the same, I think there are two pillars of the same strategy. So if we think about what Paolo was mentioning before, like the sustainability of a company, you, you need both. I mean, you cannot have a sustainable company without an innovation culture and without talents. Yes, you, sir. Just a few words. I, I use uh, this uh, definition, adaptive data culture, because adaptive combine two elements. The stability, someone is called autopoietic force. What is try to, to keep the organization stable and uh, the other one is the innovation. Innovation is brought bring by, brought by uh, pressure, external pressure, competition. Without competition, an organization would have no force, no uh, momentum to innovate. So the, the balance of, the, of these two is uh, related to what I call adaptive data culture. I don't know whether it is good, good for all, but mm -hmm. it's my position. Thank you. Yes, uh, Emanuela. Hi, I'm Marina Jemona from uh, Capgemini. And I, I want to say two things. And I think that uh, Emanuela is, um, is right about innovation, but I see a lot of companies and I think that it's still important to talk about that. <laughs> it's, it's not all, I mean, it, the, having a data culture is still on the table as a, as a main issue. So, and the other thing is that I'm not sure that innovation is brought by competition because I've been working for a lot of time in a monopolistic uh, company that was the, te the old Telecom Italia and there were much more investments and much more uh, innovation. The truth is that it's a more broad, in broad innovation and less uh, pulled by the market needs. So it's a more general purpose innovation. So, but maybe it's even more innovative than, the, than just going to... Uh, trying to win something on the market, which can be innovative, but also you always want the return on investment in three months. So it's <laughs> kind of not that much innovation. But I, I like very much, I support the vision of the gentleman there that the wheels are the data culture. We are talking about data culture, right? Not, so wheels are data culture and the, the car is the talent. So you, you have the wheels, but you, if you don't have anything to bring, then no point having the wheels. And you have the car, you cannot, bring it everywhere. So I, I think that's the, my favorite metaphor of today. Someone in the back, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the gentleman just over there. Hi, Emiliano De Simoni. Uh, I'm the head of technology. I work in a different company like UX Data Porte and uh, Hewlett Packard. I would say that if you want to generalize further uh, that uh, data culture, innovation culture, culture in general, and people are like the question, who was born first, the egg or the, or the chicken? <clears throat> and we said that both are very important because culture without people uh, does not mm. make sense, and the same for, 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 for the opposite, so the people without culture is the same. So this is something that are strictly correlated and uh, both are important in this, uh, in this case. Interesting, so the one does not go without the other, essentially. 
Someone else has any, any thoughts on this? Otherwise, I'm going to throw some, some of my thoughts. Yes, the gentleman just there. Hello. I'm Naras Simban, working as a business operations analyst at Eurofins. I would support culture because you could have talent, but they would be focusing on a one particular, let's say, one particular KPI. So it, we have to have a dynamic uh, always on the lookout because companies can be innovative only if they anticipate the customer value. And if you're hooked on to the same culture, there's organizational inertia and you cannot move forward. Technologies become obsolete over time. So we always have to be on the lookout, lookout for new data and that's why I support culture. Thank you. Yeah, Emanuela, please. I just, just want to add a small thing that data culture and talent will take us nowhere without a strategy at the very end of the discussion. That's, that's what I Fair enough. <laughs> end yeah. up with. I, th I, I think we can I agree know. with that, yeah. Uh, someone else? Uh, yes. No, I voted for culture, I confirm culture, because I think that talent, uh, uh, if it is uh, within an environment which is not conducive uh, for innovation, will not have in, uh, a significant impact. So in order to, to talents to have impact into the organization, we need uh, a data culture, innovative culture to be present. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the gentleman in the back. Uh, hello, Emilio Di Lorenzo, Unicredit. Um, as we started with a provocative question, so uh, maybe uh, remark, provo provocative remark. Um, so maybe data culture is more important because if we do have data culture, then the organization will not need talent. So if we have a proper data culture, the organization is able to work, is able to, um, to progress, even not, not just counting on, on the talents. I know it's provocative, uh, but. That, that's perfect. <laughs> If, okay, so if we have a fantastic, yes, uh, and, th and then I'll, I'll, take you, I'll take your thought further in just a minute. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alessandra Poggio. I'm a data protection um, associate in Rancid, and, uh, which is a company that works with talents, especially. So uh, I chose talent, but that's not the bias. Um, I chose talent, and what you said, of course, is very strong. Uh, because I think that uh, I have to come back to the thing that most uh, impressed me on this last panel, the fact that there's need to speak the same language. I mean, because talents are more than one kind and culture is one in different companies. Okay, could be one. One is the one that gets proposed. So what the need to understand is that those two things all the talents with their different, different specialties understand one culture and are able to propose <coughs> their own culture fitting in their reality. If I do marketing, if I do IT, if I do data uh, compliance or legal, whatever. We need to talk all together, understanding which is, which is the purpose. So, thank you. Someone else? Does a good data culture immediately attract talent? Is it always the case like that? Yes, you, you may. Hi, uh, my name is Alice Kaziragi. I work in IBM IX before in China and uh, at the Italian government for the digitalization before. Um, I, I wanted to say that for me, in order to build this data culture, sometimes you need to bring in the talent that has the vision and start from there because you need to explain why this data culture is important. And so you start with the talent uh, sometimes. Uh, I've seen it in the public administration. I've seen it in places where there was no such culture that somebody needs to bring in the why first. And then the data culture is like the wheels of the car. It becomes the wheels of the car. Someone wants to comment on that. Oh you, uh, oh, you agree, great. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, sir. Fully agree, but uh, not just a talent, but also leader to start, to start uh, uh, 
Great. Okay, so let's let's get back to the point of the gentleman that 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 was earlier. So basically, if I understood correctly, the point was: what if we eliminate the talent? Can an organization survive just with like exceptional and exceptional data culture, but scarce talent? Any thoughts on that? Saw someone reacting there. Would you like to comment? <coughs> yeah, we have a microphone just coming for you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Marco Andreozzi uh, from the Eco Green Lab in Pisa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think my reaction was enough to, <laughs> yeah, of course not. I mean, we need talents, you know, we need to, to find out talents in school, etc. So basically. Basically, no. Basically, yeah, you need talent. Oh, basically, yes, you need to talent. Yeah. 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 Okay, yes, you sir, just in the back. I think that... The market can allow businesses to survive, but with talent, then you can see what, what is the win. You can actually overachieve in that market. Um, and from experience again, where only say five years ago, Eurofins had poor um, data culture. Now they're starting to be driven by that and their growth is growing, even though they had double-digit growth every single year for over 20 years, so they were surviving, <coughs> but they had poor culture. Now they've got a better culture, and they're growing bigger. So they can survive because the market allows it. Interesting. So that, that, that almost implies that the talent this year is more, is, is, is more important. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. So um, I think it's probably is not whether a company can uh, survive or not. The question probably is uh, whether you have a, an average pool of talent or an exceptional pool of talent, then what changes is the performance, not the survival, right? As, with a, an obvious uh, consequence. Then the question is, back to my point about the talents, uh, <clears throat> you don't need, it depends on what you need to do. On data engineering or data management, data governance, you don't need the exceptional talent. You need operational discipline. On data science, on the more advanced uh, technology, you probably need right, the guru of mm. that technology. So again, uh, you don't want the, the prima donna on the, on the data ingestion processes. You need just one that, that someone that does the job good enough, right? So again, <clears throat> Talent depends on, that's why I'm saying talents, right? So sometimes the, uh, the best person, uh, you don't need the best person all across. You need maybe a, a good process that enables average people to perform the job. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> great talents are very scarce, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, any final points before we go into the break? I think we have two, two more minutes. Someone else who wants to say something, someone who maybe disagrees with everything that has been said here. Oh, the gentleman just in the back. <laughs> uh, small talk and provocative. Um, Guadagni from uh, the visual agency. Uh, I used to work for Microsoft for 12 years, and I had a lot of different bosses. One of my preferred boss <coughs> was always saying, not too many talents in the same room because they destroy the house. Because when you have too many talents, then it's, they are very difficult to manage. So I totally agree with the gentleman there saying we don't need so many talents. We need an aggregation of different uh, skills. So some talents and some operational guys. And otherwise, it, it's a mess. Brilliant. I think this is actually a very nice way of closing off the debate. So thank you. Some optimism here. <laughs> Uh, right, is there someone who, is there, I just want to see before we wrap up and we go into, into a break, is there someone who changed their mind by listening to, to, to the others or we're just like, no? Is there someone who, who sort of maybe thought that culture is more important but now thinks talent or talent is more important but now thinks, or, or the other way around? 
Yes, you, sir, you have some thoughts. There's, uh, yeah, Count. At the end of the day, uh, now I feel more neutral than so convinced in uh, talent or uh, probably something in, uh, in between. Great. That's usually how we know that the debate is sort of like has come to fruition when we have actually gotten some insights from that. And I think particularly the thoughts on thinking about different kinds of talents sort of in a sort of like in a, in a, in a plural form and appreciating the diversities within the organizations and sort of a two-way uh, pathway between these two variables is particularly important. So thank you so much for contributing. We now have about um, 50 minutes of break. Uh, there are some refreshments, some coffee outside, so I'll see you just right back here for the final panel and then for the second debate. Thank you for listening and see you shortly.
una lotta continua a questo punto. Ah, io con Pasquarelli in Inghilterra pure, <ride> guarda. <ride> Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. Okay, for the final ones to trickle in. All right, fantastic. So let's start with the second half of this forum. Really excited about this. Um, well, one of the questions that we have been sort of receiving quite a lot of feedback and a lot of questions in, in advance in organizing this, this, this forum has been, of course, the topic of harnessing artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, I probably don't have to say, is sort of now this huge buzzword that is now proliferated across most of business, most of government, most of social discourse, uh, simply because of the pure capabilities that these tools can provide. Uh, but of course, the question is not only how far and how fast can we go with artificial intelligence, but it's also a matter of doing it right. And so the question of ethical and responsible AI is of course one that is just as important as the development of the technology itself. And research backs this claim up. Um, some of our findings from economist impact research show that for a lot of executives, for example, using AI in a way that is responsible is considered to be a source of competitive advantage. And in fact, I do remember earlier even a statement from uh, Paolo Balboni who mentioned that uh, he's conducting research on privacy as a matter of CSR. So the topic of the responsible and ethical AI is crucial, and that is what I would like to discuss today with my fellow panelists who are joining us uh, in this discussion. So we have here, first of all, Alessandro Barardi, who is head of AI and data science at Unicredit. Thank you so much for joining. Emanuela Girardi, who is founder of Pop AI and a board member at ADRA and a member of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence of the Italian government. And, Mar and Marina Gemona, who is Director, Enterprise Data of AI and Analytics and Kev Gemini Invent. Thank you so much for being here. Yep. Right, so I would like to start out with what we call some quick fire questions. So some questions that are just sort of like to, to warm us up a little bit perhaps, but nothing, no monologue, so nothing really long. But let's just start, Marina, just with you, just to, to get the ball rolling. Um, imagine you're a consultant tasked with helping a traditional non-tech industry embrace AI, okay? What's your first piece of advice to initiate their AI journey? Emanuela or Marina? Uh, Marina, sorry. Marina. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just, you're confusing us. Uh, the first is start with the strategy. Start with the why. Start with what do you want to use AI for? Not from I want to use AI, what do I use it for? Brilliant. Alessandro, next one to you. Um, lots of conversations about AI and data at the moment. Quick scroll through LinkedIn and you just find everything uh, about it. So, um, but among all this amount of information, what's sort of your most unexpected or maybe surprising fact or statistic or some nugget that you found that, that you think our audience should know? Well, generative AI now is a big uh, momentum. We are living now the hype of generative AI something that I read and I find very interesting and that people should know is about sustainability of this new technology. Right. Um, I don't know if you know how much electricity you need in order to train a foundational model. I don't know if you can uh, guess. <laughs> It's about uh, the electricity that uh, 120 homes in USA need during all the year. Or uh, if we think in terms of the uh, clean, fresh water you need in order to train this large language model is about 700,000 liters. Just to say, I come from artificial intelligence. I'm very on this topic. But if I think about the, the height we are living now with generative AI, we should all focus on ethical aspects, but also on the sustainability, sustainability that is related to ethics. Brilliant. And Emanuela, just this one here to you. In sort of this data-driven world, um, what sort of is one metric that most executives should really have on their, on their radar? And why is it crucial for their success? I think responsible AI is a, is a whole, I would say. 
So that's, uh, which is, I mean, then we have to go into detail and define what does it mean and which framework to use. But definitely, I think that, uh, I mean, like Marina said, and also like uh, Alessandro said, the goal is important. So, I mean, when you, when you want to define a project, first you have to think about what you want to do. And so I think that the sustainability, of course, uh, should be the main goal for a company, not making just profit, but being sustainable. And then definitely I mean, to develop, uh, when it comes to AI and to data, develop a system that uh, are responsible. Brilliant. So the ethicality of a product is sort of like a measurement that we need to, to ensure. Great. So let's start with now that we're sort of, in the, we got the ball rolling. Let's start with sort of the, the, the first point that, that Marina mentioned. And this one is, is, is uh, I'll be really keen to hear your opinion, the strategy. Okay. We talk about the data and analytics strategy. Um, and, 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 and how do you feel sort of are currently businesses looking to develop this data and analytics uh, strategy? What sort of are the main trends that you see, see happening out there? I can tell you what I see and what I would like to see. <laughs> I can Even tell you the two, <laughs> the two points of view. I see a rush and a hurry by all companies to be the first, or at least not to be the last, to adopt and put to value this new, new, which is not so new, but at least it's, uh, it's, it's become very, very popular now, uh, technology of artificial intelligence. And so there's a fear of missing out, right? Fear, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not the first, I'm not, someone else will come with the, it's a little bit like last year in the metaverse. Did, do you remember last year? Did you have your office in the metaverse? No, oh, too bad. <laughs> or are you going without an office in the metaverse? So, and it's a pity because I believe AI is really foundational for a whole lot of interesting stuff that we'll be able, we will be able to do in the future. Um, so what I hear is this fear of missing out, uh, the hurry to do something with AI, whatever. Let me know, they, everybody asks for use cases. So let me know what else they have done, what the other companies are doing. Give me use cases, give me use cases. And what I would like, and then we'll find what, what could be in the middle. What I would like would be a company coming and say, Okay, I know that there's this very powerful technology, and this is my strategy, my high level, my business strategy. That's what I want to become. I want to become bigger, or I want to cut my costs, I want to become more sustainable, I want to, whatever, your strategy. I want to expand, blah, blah. And can I use this, this technology in some way to help me reach my goals? Or at least can I even get bigger or broader goals thanks to this technology? And then what happens is that you begin, you begin this build bridging, right, Be between people who knows what AI can, can do and examples, use cases as examples, and people who knows what the company, where the company wants to go. What are the goals, what are the pain points and the objective. Then you start building this bridge and you construct, you create a place of innovation that didn't exist before. And that's where you're going to build your special golden use case that will make the difference for your company. That's what I would love. Interesting. So are we saying the business strategy is the data strategy or the AI strategy? It, the business strategy would be the one to drive the AI strategy because that first you, you look for this place and then you build the strategy to get there. From, you assess where you are and then you build the strategy to get there. But first you need to know where to go. Fantastic. So, and, and uh, Alessandro, this one here is for you. And this is really just to echo one of the points that, that Heather meant, meant earlier, sort of where AI and all, great, fine, that's, there is an opportunity there. But the foundation is the information architecture, or let's call it the data foundation, right? That needs to be put in place, otherwise very difficult to harness these opportunities. What do you see are sort of the main steps that organizations are taking to build that data foundation in the first place. So as um, Marina was saying, you know, what I see from the field is that we are moving from uh, a, a scattered adoption of artificial intelligence, talking about Unicredit cross country. Yes, we developed in the past some data driven or artificial intelligence application with relatively large impact. What we see now, also thanks to generative AI, we are moving from a scattered adoption to a transformative one where uh, they are asking us to embed artificial intelligence strategy within the business strategy and not do the AI strategy and then 
hope that the business is going to embrace your strategy. So if we want to scale up the adoption and the value, because we want to do it in a way that it's uh, uh, aligned with some business uh, strategy, you need to uh, operationalize artificial intelligence. So what, what I mean, no, I don't know if you've heard about data operationalization no, and uh, data ops. And uh, my team since two years is working in this, uh, uh, in this direction. So creating standard and protocol that tell people how to do data-driven or artificial intelligence application from the design <coughs> to the deployment up to even the commissioning and retirement of the application. So um, in my opinion, the first step that uh, it's important if a company wants to scale up the AI adoption is to uh, proceed with the operationalization. Some example is future store or using reusable package uh, codes and so on, because this reduce time to market. It is always what the business asks us, so to be fast, but also help us to ensure consistency about what we create, uh, but also reliability, scalability of the application we are doing, but also the uh, fact that we, can, we are able to maintain this application over time. If we think about protocols, about ethics, uh, uh, fairness, and so on, we need to measure, track this KPI, and then alert real time whenever one of these KPI is going to um, is going now to exceed a specific threshold depending on the application you, so you are using. So first step is having the foundation in order to be able to uh, create artificial intelligence application fast, but then able to maintain them for a mm. long-term uh, successful. Uh, and story. this is fantastic. And I think the, the point here is, is precisely when I think about this oper oper operationalization, my God about using sort of this data in a fast way, in a clean way, and have it almost like a self-service for different developers to use it in, effectively, right? So that allows us to start that foundation. Now, and this one here is a, is a question that, Emmanuel, I'm giving you a heads up. Um, we think about this data, we think about accessing this data, and we want to put it into these new intelligent systems if we want. Um, how can we do this in a way while maintaining privacy? of, for example, the customers we serve, of the people that will be affected by, by the decisions of these, these tools? I think that, okay, first of all, even if Marina maybe doesn't agree, <laughs> I think that we should, uh, we should have a sort of um, mindset shift from uh, digital to AI mindset, because I think that, uh, I mean, if you think about, for instance, we were talking later, we're talking about the information infrastructure. So when it comes only to digital, you have uh, all the data that are uh, um, storage in data warehouses. But then when it comes to AI, you have all the data that are in data lake. And very often in companies, I think that we see them very often, uh, you have these two systems that they have to talk to each other and you even have different uh, data governance model. So the first thing is to have a sort of uh, a, a modern platform when it comes to data. And that's the first thing. Then, of course, it was mentioned in the, in the second panel, you need to have uh, AI and data literacy, because I think that you cannot talk about data without talking about AI, uh, and, and vice versa. And the third thing, which comes to your question, is that uh, I mean, you need to develop uh, a, a data governance framework. And data governance framework, which is not only, I mean, maybe most of the people think that it's just about data management, but data management <laughs> is just one of the pillars of a data uh, governance framework. And there are lots of frameworks at the moment, also when it comes to responsible AI, this is more or less the same. There are about, the OECD says that there are about 700 frameworks that are, are already in sort of in a library. So how can you develop it? And this is then, and it allows you to ensure that the privacy and all the other criteria or the trustworthy AI or the, the, the data governance, the data quality that you need are, um, are met. So when it comes to this kind of framework, you have to start about data quality, and then of course you have to ensure that the data are, are um, from, uh, 
free of bias, free of errors, complete, and so on. Then you have, I think that Andrea was mentioning the data stewardship. Then you have to understand who is responsible also later, who is responsible for the data inside the value chain also of the data um, storage. And then, uh, and collection, and then you have uh, the data protection and the data privacy. And this is also very important because when it comes to, um, to data use for AI, it's not only privacy. I mean, there are lots of other criteria mm -hmm. that need to be met, especially when it comes to ethical AI. And so this part is really very, very complex. And then the last part, of course, it's data management. So it can we go back to the to the infrastructure that you need. <coughs> Absolutely. And I mean, I, I remember, I think, back in 2018, there were 70 frameworks, AI ethics framework. This is now expanded endlessly. So I, and, but it highlights a certain issue, in my view, that whilst there are a lot of frameworks, there's a question of trust there. So to ask you a follow-up question on that, um, Emanuela, can decisions and recommendations made by AI be trusted? I think the trust is really the major concern when it comes to AI because you have these two bubbles at the moment. You have the people who think that AI will save us and the people who think that AI will kill us all. And uh, like Margaret Festager said, and I do agree 100%, she said that when it comes to AI, trust is not a nice to have, it's a must. And so I think that really trust is the key. So, I mean, to ensure that the, um, the system that we are developing, the AI system, are trustworthy, at least, I mean, in the European definition of trustworthy, you have to go back and to see which one are the criteria, and then you have to make sure that all the criteria are met through the entire value chain. And when it comes to the value chain of AI, and today we didn't mention that, it's super complex because you have the data part, so who collects the data, who do the, I mean, the preparation for the data and so on. Then you have to who develops the algorithm, then you have to who test the algorithm, then there is the deployment, then there is the user of the algorithm. So it is super complex and you have to ensure that through the entire value chain, all these criteria are met and that the results, the outcome of the algorithm is trustworthy. Absolutely, and, and uh, this, is, this could be one for Alessandro actually. So we, we see that there's sort of this like incredibly complex sort of like, like puzzle of different issues that come together. They're all related to each other, uh, but ultimately we have to make it work in some way. We have to operationalize it in some way. Um, so, Alessandro, what do you feel are sort of some of the, if we were to look at sort of the four, three, four points maybe um, of best practices for building uh, trust in these kinds of AI systems, in the, in the development, what, what do you think are sort of the main criteria? Yeah, criteria? I mean, uh, then working in a financial institution, you may understand that trust is top priority okay. because trust is not only, you know, uh, for, for our customer, it's not only the, how we manage payment or uh, current account and so on, but how we use data. So I think for each step of a data-driven uh, or artificial intelligence application, there are different best practices. I can mention some and maybe focus on only one. So during the design and development of artificial intelligence application, one topic uh, as uh, um, uh, Emanuela. Emanuela saying. <laughs> Marina Emanuela, okay, <laughs> was saying is data governance and quality, so understand uh, and check if the data we are using in order to predict the phenomena is um, uh, free of bias, so or is representative of the phenomena that we want to do. Other best practice is the privacy preservation and the, and the transparency, so to track all the transformation pipeline we do on our data when we feed uh, uh, application or model, during the, develop, during the deployment phase, it's important to do the bias uh, and fairness test. So understand and identify if there are some discriminatory patterns in our uh, uh, models. And for instance, working on different models for assessing the credit worthiness of our customer, this is very important. So, so ensure that your data represent the phenomena and understand if in the outcome, and so decision making, there is any kind of discriminatory pattern. Uh, when we deploy, what is important is the explainability. And here I come back to the concept of trust. Trust is not only of our customer, but also of our colleagues that they, they need to use this artificial intelligence. Because if I build a propensity model or recommender system and I give these models to our colleagues on the branches, they are not going to use it. 
because mm -hmm. you know there is this kind of mistrust. Okay, they this model are, are doing my job. You no, know? uh, well, we need to provide uh, not black box, but model whose outcome can be explained. The reason why of why the machine elaborating huge amounts of data, big data, is giving this kind of insight. And I think that's actually a very nice way of breaking it down. So on the one hand, uh, in the development, sort of the fairness of the systems, making sure that the outputs do not have any kind of biases. So that's the second one. And the third one, that we can actually explain why we came to a certain conclusion rather than it just like falling from the sky. And I think there's, there's sort of a, an interesting one, particularly when it comes to biases. I know one that there is a, a strong... Uh, consciousness among society because in part it affects them uh, either if they're part of the public or even if they're part of like an organization internally so and I, I know this this is one thing I, I wanted to ask you Marina so what what do you think are sort of the the possibilities the mechanisms perhaps to reduce that bias mm -hmm. as much as possible I think there are two ways one is human and the other is machine driven. <laughs> the first one is to ensure that during the design of a system, all a, a diverse team is involved. And when I say diverse, I mean all the stakeholders and of the context where these, whatever you're doing, will be used. So if it's something for society, all elements of society need to be at the table, designing it. Otherwise, if we live, and also, Technical people will need to be there, but also humanists have to be there. Sociologists, philosophers, other humans. Otherwise, if you leave it up to engineers, I don't want to know what. <laughs> I see what that. Uh, it, it is very dangerous because there, there are people who have studied a lot of years in order to understand society and what's good for society and what's ethics. So it. it it's something, you know, we could discuss until I don't know, next year about <laughs> what's correct and what's not. How, how should a corpus of data be composed in order to represent the whole of society, right? We say that when you ask a, a picture of a manager to meet Journey or, or to Dali or whatever, only middle-aged men come up. Okay, that's correct, because most managers are middle-aged men. <laughs> but we don't want this to... Uh, condition our future. We want that in the future, all races, all genre, all sexes, all everyone will be there, right? So how do we cope with that? Do we want to put all possible um, ethnicity for that? I mean, anyone should, or any age, or from what age should we force the system to have managers inside to show up? Manager, sixteen years old. Yeah. or 19 years old, I don't know. It's, a, it, it's an ethical question. So you need people who knows how to cope with this. There's an, an expertise. There's people who study for that. So first of all, the design. And then you might have started with the best intention, but you need to check if the, as Alessandro was already saying, you need to check if the corpus, the, this ensemble of data is actually balanced. And this can be done with the aid of AI, in fact. So AI checks it, I'm not going into details. And at the very end, if it's unbalanced, unbalanced, you can try to rebalance it synthetically with synthetic data. And again, generative AI is very helpful. Now it's much easier to build synthetic data, which are like normal data, but you don't have enough uh, women manager or young women manager or black women manager. Okay, we construct them. And AI is very good at doing that. So your system, your corpus of data will be balanced in the way that the design team has imagined. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I, I think it, it kind of like almost naturally brings us to sort of the next final third, perhaps, uh, of, of this conversation, which is if we look at um, regulations and laws, many times we say that laws and regulations are the codification of ethics. And, and so this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is one for you, Emanuele, because I know you, you have quite some involvement, particularly also with the public sector. And there is obviously a lot of momentum around AI regulation um, in Europe, in Italy, globally. How do you see the landscape evolving right now? What are sort of the things that we need to, to be ready for, perhaps, which I'm sure is going to be relevant for the members of our audience? Sure. So, okay, today there is a huge discussion about AI regulation globally, I would say. 
So, and especially, I mean, I think it will, uh, the regulation will dominate the discussion at least of the next two, three years probably until the AI Act will, uh, will come into, into the market. Uh, so we have the AI Act in Europe, and then you have uh, already three regulations that are uh, uh, already in the market in China. You have one in Brazil, one in Canada, several bills in the States, uh, and, um, and now there is this new attempt uh, of, uh, on one side of the G7 that they are trying to define a sort of code of conduct for industry that, of course, will not, I mean, would, it's not possible that it's mandatory. It will be on a voluntary base uh, for industry to sort of adopt a sort of responsible AI approach. And then, of course, you have the AI Safe Safety Summit that is coming up uh, in the next two or three weeks uh, on the 1st of November in UK. And so everybody is trying to define the sort of global approach to AI. And I think that this would, it's very difficult because uh, we have uh, different priorities, different set of values, uh, and different approach to AI globally. So on one side, it is very difficult to come up with the global uh, AI regulation. On the other hand, we need to come up with something. It's, it's lost a sort of, uh, at least a sort of a common principle, harmonized principle, I would say. So I think I'm quite positive about the AI Safety Summit, and I think that they will come up with something. And I think that they will do it for one reason. I think that this then it's a geopolitical point because uh, I think that US, they don't want to suffer anymore another regulation from the Brussels effect from Europe mm. because they already suffered a lot from the GDPR, from the Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, and so on. And so this time, they either will come up uh, with a regulation on their own or they will come up hopefully with something that it's in between. Just to give you an idea, I mean, last week, one of the shadow reporter of the AI Act went to Washington to have a discussion to see what's going on and which kind of a regulation they could develop. So I think this is already a good sign that there will be, a, I mean, there is a need to define something globally. And also the fact that China has been, at the end, has been invited to the AI Safety Summit, I think that it's also quite promising because you need to define at least some common standard or harmonized standard mm -hmm. for the, like you said before, for the engineering part, the operationalization of, uh, of AI at the end. Brilliant. This is a fantastic overview, and I think it really allows us to look into the future, which is very helpful. And, uh, and, and, and um, uh, Marina, this, if we kind of think about the, the, this upcoming regulation, okay, and we put ourselves in the shoes of people who actually develop these systems. How can we bring in the regulatory compliance in, their, in the development? I'd say by design. By design. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the only way. The people, uh, we, we are already getting people to know, to study all that's going on, so that they are ready whenever there will be a common. We already have a framework, right? We try to be as conservative as possible so that we do the thing at as best, but mm, while things come up, we get uh, informed and we study so that we can put it during the design phase already, these uh, this requirements in advance, because we don't want our stuff, the stuff that we develop to become out of law in three years time. We want that what we develop will be strong and uh, compliant even in the future, so we are trying to Interesting. do that. When it comes to responsible AI then, is this the role of one individual personal function, or is everyone responsible for it? Uh, how many hours do we have to discuss yeah. this? <laughs> um, it, that's up to the, the single company to single companies to decide that. The point is that someone, someone, a legal entity or a person, has to be responsible. You cannot say that the responsibility is to the, in the system. So, if it's in the system, then it must be clear. Who is the system? And as Emanuela was saying, the system might be the one who built it, the one who, who trained it, the one who trained it on the job. So the one who provided the data, who, an AI system you'll define in the company who will be responsible for, for that. That's my opinion, though. So. Absolutely, absolutely fine. Uh, Alessandra, and then sort of to close this up, we have mentioned now these upcoming regulations um, uh, but of course, I, I remember in sort of some of our discussions, we uh, leading up to this panel, we said like, well, you create kind of a regulation, and then sort of there's a new technical uh, technical breakthrough, like with generative AI. And in Europe, I'm, I know I'm aware that there's a huge debate of whether Gen AI and foundation models can be covered through the EU AI, or should be covered through the EU AI Act. Um, what is the role, or what's the future? Do you think of standards and self-regulation? in light of these kinds of developments. Okay, so... Um, we have 50 seconds, by the way. Okay. <laughs> well, so, um, 
what I see is that, uh, okay, AI acting is coming, but just if you need, if you read the definition of artificial intelligence, we can start debating. Okay, so starting from the first uh, line. So for me, the principles are clear and can be applied to artificial intelligence or generative AI. So the principles are the fairness, bias, I guess we mentioned them, uh, transparency, responsibility, accountability, who is responsible for. But I'm in the field and it's not easy to understand how to create this framework. So how to, I use again this word, operationalize the principle. So we need some guidelines in order to uh, proceed. And with generative AI, this is even more important because technologically we are advancing so far. So mm. we are building a, a knowledge-based search engine, leveraging generative AI and so on, but we do not yet understand what are the guardrails where we need to use these uh, um, new technologies. So just to close, I think that the principles are clear, but we need guidelines, but not to replace principle, but just kind of the North Star to know how we need to operationalize, I don't know, what is fairness, transparency, accountability, responsibility. I try to answer the question from also from Marina about who, what, who does what. In my opinion, there is the law of compliance as to publish the policy, risk as to identify which are the metrics so now you assess the level of risk or your artificial intelligence application, then there is the artificial intelligence team that has developed committing to specific guard, guardrails and guidelines, then who is going to use the application and depending on the usage is doing is the final you know, responsible of uh, the uh, ethical usage of the artificial intelligence application. Fantastic. That, that was a great summary in the short amount of time we had. So thank you so much for this. Question time. We have microphones around. Who has a question? Yes, you, sir. A uh, microphone's coming. Thank you. Can you please uh, explain the relationship between uh, the uh, responsible AI and uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, especially <coughs> SDG number nine, which talks about uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, manufacturing? Brilliant. So the relationship between responsible AI and, and um, I would say each one of you can start from. I mean, as you go first. Sorry, as I, as I was saying at the beginning, I think that one of the principle of, or I would say, guidelines operationalize the principle of uh, um, AI Act or trustworthy AI is the sustainability. As I mentioned before, these uh, technologies today are going to. Um, um, run on massive, huge amounts of data and require high computing power. So uh, regardless of the um, industry where are going to be applied, because some of these uh, foundational model of generative AI are general purpose, uh, you need to understand you know, what you want and uh, uh, if uh, the specific uh, uh, technology is going to fit with, your, uh, with the goal uh, uh, that you have, because today I heard people that wants to train foundational model, but uh, for what? I mean, we have uh, today foundational model, general purpose that can do um, several and accomplish different tasks. Why you need to retrain on a specific or vertical knowledge? Uh, but as uh, uh, Marina was saying at the beginning, there is this rush to say, okay, I, bu I build the first chat GPT within my company in private network and then maybe it's not even sustainable because uh, the business case is going to be negative. Um, I don't know if I answer, but uh, the trustworthy AI and sustainability, there is a very strong correlation. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, just uh, if we can keep it short. It's very difficult to be quick because I teach a course on AI for sustainable development, so I could, I could give you a very long explanation on that. I just tell you two things very quickly. 
first, uh, that AI is a set of tools, of course, uh, and, so, and you need them to reach the SDGs, and this is also what we are teaching. And, uh, and I think that you need a sort of paradigm uh, shift. So first, a human-centric approach is not enough when it comes to AI, but you have to adopt a sort of planet-centric approach, so a sustainability approach, I would say. And then, uh, okay, and then we could talk for hours, especially about the carbon footprint of technologies, because I don't know if you all read it, but a couple of days ago, uh, the Pope Francesco, he published uh, Laudate Deum, which is a very interesting 16 pages paper. At the moment, I invite you to read it, because it really talks about also the sustainability of technologies and the carbon footprint of technologies. And it says it's a fantastic set uh, it brings a fantastic uh, opportunities, but you also need to consider the side effect. And one of the side effects uh, is the carbon footprint of uh, technologies. Marina, final closing. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Okay, well, thank you so much. I think this was a fantastic, really fascinating discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank our speakers. Thank you, thank you so much. Right, and we have another debate now as sort of the final element before we actually close off this forum. So, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation in, your, in the previous one. I thought it was incredibly insightful. And we have for this one here a similar motion, slightly provocative, there's no right or wrong answer, um, as we had before. And this one here relates to some extent as well on the topic that we discussed earlier, just as this one on sort of data protection, and innovation. So, the motion for this debate here, I'm going to read it out loud, is this house believes data protection impedes innovation. Okay? I'll read it out again. This house believes data protection impedes innovation. Right. For the sake of this one here, just to keep people a bit more animated, no more neutral people, okay? So when we vote, <laughs> it's just one or the other. So who of you believes that data protection impedes innovation? Please raise your hand. Oh, wow, okay. Who of you thinks that data protection does not impede innovation? Please raise your hand. All right, who's neutral? You. Okay. Great. Excellent. All right, so let's, let's uh, well, maybe I'll be in favor of that then. Um, so let's start with the first one. Who, why, why do you guys think that data protection does not impede innovation? This is a very different, very different scenario from what I've seen in the United States, for example. So who wants to get started? Yeah, you, sir. Your question is a quite complex one. Of course, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, data protection in a very strict way pose, uh, poses uh, some uh, obstacles to innovation. But we have to be clever, clever. We have to devise a way to build uh, innovation out of the rules that protect people and, and the planet. So I think that uh, is a more complex uh, to work uh, with with uh, constraints, but is also more challenging and more, uh, perhaps, uh, let's say, um, providing providing uh, satisfaction. Interesting. Thank you very much. Who wants to go next? Thank you. I think that sustainability is also thinking about, as human beings, where do we want to go, in what world do we want to live, what are our values, right? So, in this sense, having our data protected against the use, which could be just for profit, because that's the point at the, at the very end, right? So, it's because maybe we want a world, so we want to foster long-term and human-centered innovation rather than market-centric innovation. So that's the, the point for me. Paolo. I think also maybe you said uh, in the US you had a different conversation, but uh, for example in the US literature on data protection you have this um, uh, fiduciary relationship, uh -huh. which I think is also interesting because uh, 
uh, aside from legislation, horizontal legislation, because they don't have uh, anything similar to the GDPR, uh, you still have uh, this expectation that if you entrust an organization with data, your data will be protected and processed in a, a respectful way. So I think when we say uh, data protection uh, um, stops or uh, slow down uh, the innovation, we need to understand uh, what kind of data protection. Are we talking about the GDPR specifically? Are we talking about uh, the principles uh, on privacy and data protection? Uh, privacy and data protection as a fundamental right? So I think at the end of the day, we, we have witnessed uh, the shortcomings of the GDPR. We are now uh, witnessing a, a massive expansion of data-related uh, legislation. Will that slow down uh, the pace of innovation? Probably yes, but I think so far it's been uh, developed in a fairly unregulated way with consequences that will uh, potentially uh, jeopardize uh, the freedom of speech and more generally freedom of developing their own thoughts for new generations. So I think it's a, it's a, a way to try to reproportion a little bit innovation in a way that is sustainable, also for people and not just for the planet. Yeah, please, sir. So my, my view is that uh, um, data protection does not impede uh, innovation, but it contributes to define it. Okay, so I think is a is a way of shaping innovation rather than preventing innovation, and uh, the uh, the second comment I like to share is uh, <coughs> uh, moving forward, if we follow the paradigm where trust or protection and so on is uh, set on top of the of, of the technology, there always will be a gap, because regulation is always uh, slower than the innovation cycle and and the and the distance will go faster and bigger rather than slower and, and smaller. So <clears throat> the answer to this is that you need to build trust into the systems, not, not, not in technology, I mean systems as a general term, and not on top of them. So trust has to be embedded in the, in the operating models rather than applied ex post from the top. So we move from compliance, right, to trust, and that is uh, uh, my uh, personal opinion. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, you. Um, thank you. Uh, just, just one thought I want to add. Um, I don't think that data protection or a regulatory, a well-defined well and well-built regulatory context will impede innovation. On the contrary, um, I think that poses a challenge that can be uh, helpful for, uh, for a search, even for a search, pure research or applied research, in order to do better. I ju just give you an example. For example, um, in, um, in generally, we are part of an European consortium called Humane AI that uh, brings together uh, industrial champions and uh, um, research centers and um, universities and so on across Europe, fu funded by the uh, European Commission. Uh, through Horizon 2020 program. And uh, the focus of that research uh, consortium is building a solution, putting together industry and uh, public and university and so on uh, towards a human-centered uh, artificial intelligence. Um, within that consortium, we, I, I will not, uh, I cannot spoil the technology, but for example, we, um, that consortium help, help us a building an explicative layer on top of a neural network, and that was a quite cutting edge research agenda. In fact, we have produced a paper. That kind of, st of thing um, helped, us, helped us to better understand the, um, the, um, the limitation of um, neural networks, so something that is intrinsically uh, a black box, and also the results were shared with the research community. So uh, there was, um, sharing of knowledge, of knowledge, and I think that this is a, a positive impact on uh, on research, uh, but thanks to a strong regulatory uh, context. This is super That's helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I saw someone else raising their hand. I think where was that? Okay, I'm going to ask a few follow-up questions now, just to stimulate the conversation. It does mean I believe what I'm saying. Okay, I'm just being provocative right now. So let's, 
Let's think about foundation models, for example. And when we talk about generative AI, these systems that scan the whole web, right? It's all of the publicly available data that you can find on the web. And it's very difficult to put the guardrails there, okay? So how does that not, how does that not impede innovation? Do you want to go and like go into all of the, the foundation models and unpick sort of the data that we find there? Or how, how, do you, how would you reconcile that? Yes, Heather. Yeah. Thank you. So, so there's two differences when we generalize foundational models. One is open source, right? <coughs> the extreme being chat GPT. And we have no transparency to how that was crowdsourced, trained. You can't provide data lineage with something like that. But then there are um, a ton of startups that are building foundation models using different methodologies, using different data sets. But this is where we get into the key being that it's explainable. Um, for example, at IBM, we've been working with generative AI for over 15 years. If you know our Watson discovery, if you know our natural language processing, those were all generative AI models, but the IP was ours. So we didn't disclose how it was trained, how it was built, any of that. We've changed strategies, right? So not only do we partner with open, papers, open source providers like Hugging Face and review the Hugging Face models and then distribute them in support of use cases as part of our library, our data scientists build their own foundation models for certain purposes. We disclose the data that it's trained on. So we're training our IBM models on curated, governed data and we reference the sources. So anyone using an IBM model knows the, exactly the data it was trained on. They've got examples of use cases it's intended for, documentation about what it does. And so that's what you need to get to, right? In the previous pa panel, there was a question about black box and how do you understand or get confident in the results from AI. It needs to be explainable. You need that data lineage, you need the transparency, and then you need controls that monitor that model on an ongoing basis. So if something changes from the baseline, you know about it. And that's how the confidence continues forward. So there's a tremendous amount of potential with these foundation models, but there's also a lot of risk. Um, when I do my black box talk about AI, my favorite quote from that talk is, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's, that's Spider-Man. Um, but it's true <laughs> in this case. You need the controls to harness the power. Thank you so much. Some more thoughts on, on this one here, particularly to foundation models. Any thoughts? Any experiences made, perhaps, that someone would like to share? Okay, so I'm gonna throw another curveball now. Okay, so we, okay, we've, we've addressed the foundation models now. Let's look at global competitiveness, okay? What about data protection when it comes to global com competitiveness of like AI products? Think of, for example, I'm thinking about China, for example, right? Or the US, which has probably a laxer environment on these kinds of things. And their products are probably faster, they're probably more powerful, particularly if we look into the Chinese markets. What about data protection in the context of global competitiveness of, say, countries or economic areas? Any thoughts on that? Yes. yes. <clears throat> well, my thought might be provocative, uh, but uh, I believe that given that it is a fact that European Union is uh, kind of behind compared to China and the United States <coughs> in the, let's say, number or size of its AI, um, let's say, product that has uh, developed, I think that data protection is uh, a way to defend the competitiveness of the European uh, player. Because uh, if they, for a company that uh, starts to build in a market where there are no such uh, regulatory constraints and then have to, let's say, verticalize in a, in a regulated uh, market, it could be difficult and it could provide an edge, at least in the domestic market, for European uh, player. It's kind of a, not an happy story because it's a defensive story, but I believe that there is kind of protectionism within, behind this regulatory 
regulation. Sorry. So data protection is a source of competitiveness for companies. You have to. Then my uh, my 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 answer to that be would be why are then all the the major sort of AI companies all from the United States and China? I believe that there are two two sizes. One is the uh, the the way that capital markets work, and the fact that uh, venture capitalism is way more evolved uh, in the United States, <laughs> and. Um, Mm, also, the way in which uh, traditionally the collaboration between university and uh, companies has been in the past. I think that there is a change, but uh, it was different the way European academies and US academies were working uh, with uh, corporates. I cannot talk about China because I don't know the situation about that. Yeah. But the comparison between you and US, that is my opinion on why. Of course, said, yeah. This is not a debate between yeah, you and I, by the yeah. way. Just <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> any, any, any thoughts, by the way? Yes, uh, pl uh, please, Marina. So, uh, I believe that even if it would be more, if, even if data protection is not a source of competitiveness, I don't think that it should abide to our values. So I know that having... I don't know, polluting the environment makes you produce things at a lower cost, but not for that we are polluting the environment to, to, we are going in the opposite direction, even if we know that we lose competitiveness, right? Because if you produce something in Europe, you have to stick to some rules which are really strict not to pollute the environment, but we know very well that in other parts of the world they do produce at low cost by polluting or by using ch kids, children. So we are not abiding to all our, abiding, is that the right word? Abi yeah. Abiding <laughs> to, our, to our values uh, just because, just for competitiveness. These are values that we believe in, right? Including uh -huh. the fact that data should be treated properly, ethically. Well, that's my opinion. So it's even, even not considering competitiveness, even if it would be, I would not abide to what are our foundational values are human centricity in our planet centricity. So, someone else? Uh, yes. And, and then. Someone else? Both, both of you, yeah, first, you, you go first. I just build on what Marina was saying. I think that maybe we should think about it at least in Europe because we are lagging and there is nothing else that we can say, but it could be a sort <laughs> of uh, the, the data protection, a driver for innovation. Because maybe if we think about, I don't know, the federated machine learning, for the federated learning, or uh, if I think about, I mean, new way of, um, of using less data maybe for the training that there are, I mean, the research is developing into, into this field, like we are doing in explainability. So maybe we should invest more in research uh, that in, in the, the development of AI system that are using less data. And that maybe would be probably a, one of the drivers for a sustainable innovation. Yes, uh, the gentleman just over there. So when it comes to competition, I think there are two ways of looking at that. One is uh, uh, macro competition in between uh, large economies, uh, China, the US, Europe, and so on. And data protection is uh, creating an imbalance. Okay? Those that are not strict on requirements, they have a uh, competitive advantage then drives uh, other, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, elements of consideration, but from a pure competition, there's an unbalance at that level. Within the same uh, uh, market or the same regulated environment, the data protection becomes a, an element of competition, and I presume that most of the companies uh, that will ask for a service, they will pretend that data protection is part of, this, of the vendor, uh, 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 let's say, conditions, uh, or they will not even be considered for requests for proposals and so on. So I think a, it, it depends uh, at which level you consider the competition. So within a regulated environment, data protection becomes a, a key success factor. Uh, beyond the, the regulated environment may be, a, 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 let's say, a gap. Okay, any final points? Yes, uh, Paolo, and then uh, we, we wrap up. I think it's also a question of political power in the sense that uh, when, you, when you look at uh, uh, the data-driven economy, uh, you, you look at uh, big economies, uh, and I think the ability uh, of the uh, political establishment to bridge alliances with other markets. So um, 
I think uh, data protection uh, has uh, been very uh, high in the political agenda of the European Union to, to some extent uh, try to establish some competitive barriers for uh, US-based companies and also Chinese companies and other from other countries. It has been a way to export uh, a mentality, if you think about the GDPR, as backbone of many horizontal privacy legislation around the world. So how successful would be this uh, um, uh, way to export uh, and to create uh, an environment which is based on a uh, uh, European principle on data protection, I think, is uh, upon the political power and the, and the possibility to establish links between uh, uh, big economies together with the European Union. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, uh, we have reached the end of our debate and of the forum. For the avoidance of doubt, I too believe in data protection. but. I would like to thank everyone for participating in this really exceptional forum. I've really enjoyed myself. I've, I've learned so much from everyone who participated here as part of the panelists, as well as sort of the debate. It's really been great. A couple of key takeaways that I personally uh, sort of developed by listening to, to all of you guys is that uh, when it comes to sort of enterprises becoming data ready, I think sort of the strategy element and thinking in alignment with the business strategy is really sort of the first step to start. Talent is one of the topics that is always being discussed. Everywhere we go, talent is always sort of one of the main issues that is top of people's minds. Uh, but it cannot, it, cannot, it cannot supersede culture based on how we pursued it as, as part of the previous debate. And of course, when it comes to AI ethics, as we have seen here and also in this debate here, um, the importance is, of course, in understanding it as a competitive advantage and one that can sort of is not different or in opposition to innovation, but based on what I'm hearing here, is that it's sort of like the different side of the same coin. So I would like to thank IBM again uh, for making this discussion possible. It's always a pleasure to sort of bring in everyone here together, and I think the quality of conversations that you facilitate is really terrific. Um, I believe there will be some refreshments in the other room. Uh, so thank you so much for coming, everyone. I look forward to staying in touch, and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.